We try to stay grounded to our principles. We keep trying to say over and over again, what grounds us is a commitment to nonviolence. On this, we are totally, firmly unshakable, and we will not budge. Peacemaking. And what does that mean to make peace? What does that mean to speak about things like peace and mercy in a multicultural, bilingual society? Those are the things I've been talking about. But the New Testament is a violent set of texts. And we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, have heard the call to nonviolence despite that fact. Not because of it. Violence. Uh, is really hitting us hard in Rochester. Uh, just a week before I came, one of my children, my 16-year-old son, Daekwon, was attacked by a group of guys uh, getting off the bus. They wanted to steal a cell phone. One in three people in the U.S. know someone who has been shot. Mm -hmm. So if we think that this is just an issue of the underprivileged, we're kidding ourselves, and it's because we've been turning a blind eye time and time and time again and because we are all ashamed of how we keep on killing one another. Notice how you, you start to unpack one story and, it, and, and mm -hmm. it's the whole big story. It's all the... Yeah. in the midst of imperialism and empire, then we have to figure out how much of that empire actually lives in us. The third or fourth time that I've heard her speak, and every time I walk away completely changed person, you know, I feel like every time I'm about to be changed again forever. I'm going to give you five minutes. See if you can come up with a definition of racism. A system of privilege based on perceived phenotype. An ideology of superiority. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What is this text about? You have 10 minutes. Um, the point of that style of Bible study is to decenter the PhD in the room as the expert. Very rarely do we have time to really design a space to be sacred for us and to invite new people in um, to help us both do the work that we're doing as well as to shape the work that we will do as we go forward. Like me, a lot of people weren't aware that it was alive and active. They thought that the fellowship was the programs that are actually the Presbyterian Church's programs. And now we have, I have a better understanding of how the fellowship relates to the other peacemaking programs in the church. And I know that with people getting involved with the local issue, that that's going to help them to connect to the broader fellowship. And that, that's exciting. This gathering is not a conference to give you information so you can go home and have had a good experience. It's not why we invited you. This is a working gathering. So we've designed the whole thing so that it would give all of you the opportunity to really engage and shape where we go from here. Just really spirit-filled, you know, there's a lot of humility, there's a lot of understanding and experience and skill, but that's not what people's leading edge is. People lead with, uh, I'm just me, and what do you think of this, or what do you think? And I thought that was very inviting, very welcoming. You know, if somebody new to the fellowship, you didn't have to sort of break in. People, you know, just let you know, well, you're supposed to be here, you know, that's what we think kind of thing. I can't guess what it'll look like two years from now or five years from now, but I know this. If we're bold and committed in living into this unknown, boldly going where no one has gone before, right? and if we hold each other together and hold each other accountable and love on each other in the process, something beautiful is going to happen. It's a lock-solid guarantee. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.